base of our foundation, everything that we do in, in, in our Christianity and our walk with God it is, is based upon faith. We have a faith-based relationship that everything that we do has to be believing in and relying upon Jesus that uh, what God said will come to pass. It is true. Like I said, it, it, you know, He makes promises all through the Bible. And those promises, if they haven't already come true, they will come true. Amen? Amen. Right? Because God, God cannot lie. I think we all know that. He cannot lie. And, uh, you know, as, as the guy said, you know, can God make a rock big enough that He can't pick up? No. So it just... Things that, that God is able to accomplish in our lives if we just let Him. Amen. Uh, and if you got your Bibles, if you would turn to Romans in chapter four, and uh, I want to talk a little bit this morning, man, starting off about about faith and what faith does and has done in this particular uh, passage of Scripture here, Romans, Romans four, starting in verse five. You there say amen. 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 It says, But to one who not working by the law, who trusts and believes fully in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness, which is a standing acceptable to God. Thus David congratulates the man and pronounces blessings on him to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works he does. Blessed and happy to be to, to be envied are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered and completely buried. Amen? Amen. So when you come to Jesus, He not only takes He it's remembered no more. As one scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, it's no more remembered. And blessed and happy and to be ended again as a person whose sins the Lord will have or take no account of nor reckon against him. And this blessing is meant, is it, you know, is it meant for, and he's talking now about a, a certain situation here, but he says, is this blessing or happiness then, is it meant for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? And if you remember in the Old Testament, that's how they, they looked at people, you know, if you if you were a believer, you were circumcised, and if you weren't a believer, you were what you call uncircumcised, and they divided them, you were either Jewish or you were a Gentile. And that was the only two races back then, and as, as far as I'm concerned, still the only two races, you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. I don't oh, care what color you are or anything, you're a Jew or Jew is righteousness. How then was it credited to him? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? It was not after, but it was before he was circumcised. He received the mark of circumcision as a token or an evidence, the seal of righteousness which he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised so that he was to be made the father of all who truly believe through circumcision and thus having righteousness the right standing with God imputed to them and credited to their account, as well as that the father of those circumcised persons, which are not merely circumcised, but also walk in that faith which our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So what he's saying here is that it's not a matter of you. This doesn't automatically mean that you're, you're saved, you're going to heaven and everything because you get circumcised. It just means that and he's, now he's saying, okay, just because you've been circumcised, you still got to believe, you still got to have the faith, you still got to believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Said, and uh, you can't undo circumcision. <laughs> Once it's done, it's done. You can't, you can't undo it. And I use this in a text of a spiritual believer that you have been you have been circumcised, you have been cut away from your old way of life. So you can't go back, you can't be attached to that. You can try, but you cannot be attached to that. You cannot go back. You're separated from it, so you've been circumcised, you've been cut away. 
And I, I, I'm going to use Sean as an example. Now, he, he'd been circumcised. He'd been cut away. You know, and, and going back, he found out it didn't work. He can't be uncircumcised. He's got to remain circumcised. He, in doing so, we, we have, you know, we believe, we, when you start believing, when you say, I believe in Jesus, you've got not only to believe in Him, that He's the Son of God, but you've got to rely upon Him. You've got to trust Him. With everything you got, Sue made a good point. You know, when you get to where you think you can't tithe, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, I'd love to do this, bud, you know, I, and I'd like to do that, bud. You know, it's time to get your butt out of the way and go ahead and do what God would have you do. Amen? Right. Go ahead and, and, and move forward with God, regardless. Amen. And so trusting God in all the promises He made. In doing so, we have become the righteousness of God. And that's no small statement. We have become the righteousness of God if we fall under those conditions. That we believe in Him, we rely upon Him, and we trust Him with everything we've got, our being, our money, our family, everything that we have, we give it to Him. And we rely upon Him to reveal to us what we should do with it. Amen? Amen. Uh, turn to Romans 1.17 right quick. I guess that's a couple pages back. It says, For in the gospel, a righteous with righteousness which God describes as revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith. And it says, to, you know, I'm not reading for an amplified version here, disclose through the way of faith arouses more faith. I love that. Because you're building your faith, you're building it up. As it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live. And shall live by faith. Amen? Amen. So we're we're now right the righteousness of God. We're now supposed to be walking upright and proclaiming the name of Jesus, as it says in the Great Commission, to go into all the lands and, and preach the gospel so that everybody will know about the goodness of God, know about the salvation of Jesus, what sacrifice he made with his own life in raising up after the third day and sitting in the heaven. You got to tell the story to these people and let get, let them know. And, and you don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to be somebody that's a, it's a it's a great uh, you know well known worldwide evangelist. The only thing you've got to have to do is the willingness to do it. And you can do that. You can be led to somebody. And God will point you. The Holy Spirit will point you to somebody. Or you might just pray start and have a conversation with somebody. You know, Walmart. Joan goes there. I don't, so she'd have to do it. <laughs> Cracker Barrel, the supermarket. If you just strike up a conversation with somebody, you know they're they're looking for a can of beans and can't find them. Oh yeah, they're right over here. Let me show you. So go over there and say, well, "How you doing?" You know, you strike up a conversation with somebody, and God through His Holy Spirit will give you a discernment whether or not this person needs help needs some kind of teaching or whether they need nudging a little bit towards the spiritual ship of God or whether they need they actually just need to be saved. And not only will He lead you to that person but He will also give you the words to say to that person through His Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And I know that uh, you know, and I, I brag on Wayne and Jane all the time. They, you know, especially Jane and Wayne, Wayne just said, I think just sits back in amazement sometimes when she does. But, but but Jane just, you know, she walk into a, a, a service station, into a little store or something. I y'all be careful, bud. Okay. I just gotta go see his daughter, so they're living a little early. Uh, and, and walk into a grocery store or something and just start talking to somebody. And right away, you know, God comes into the conversation. You know, start talking about church, start talking about witnesses, start talking about living for God. And she, she's, uh, I don't know if it's the correct word to use or not, but she's a mouthpiece for God. <laughs> she's a mouthpiece for God, and, she, and she, she, she lifts up the name of Jesus and she tells people about it. And it gives you discernment, but then also gives you words of wisdom. You know, there have been, there have been so many people in the Bible. And I think everybody in here has got a favorite 
Bible person. Yeah, I hate to call them characters because it doesn't sound like you know you're talking referring to a story. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, your favorite person or you know the people in the Bible. Wow. One of my favorites is Moses. I love I love to read about Moses and, and what he went through, his trials, his tribulations. I mean, you know. Even when you know he went up on the mountain and God spoke to him and told him he was going to send him to send him to Egypt to bring the, the Israelites out of bondage, and he says, "Me? You want me to do that?" He said, "I, I, I you know, stuttering." He said, I, I, "I can't do this. I can't go before Pharaoh." And he said, "Well, you know, I'll send you a help." So he sent Aaron along with him. But you know, he goes into Egypt. A place he had just left because he'd killed someone. He went back, he goes into Egypt, and he's standing before Pharaoh and telling him to let my people or let God's people go. And so you know the story. They went through all the plagues and they went through all this stuff. And before they got to the point where Pharaoh finally just says, you know, let them go. Please, get them out of here. And you know, and, and, and they went on their own journey. And, and God directed Moses, you know, they didn't end up at the Red Sea by accident. God directed them to go and count beside the Red Sea, outside of one of the cities there. He got him set there. And uh, during all this time, Pharaoh's sitting there and he said, you know, what do we do? We let these people go. They got out of here. They, they, I mean, they were supposed to be our servants. They're supposed to be serving us. They're supposed to be taking care of all of our needs and everything. And, and, and we let them go. After all this stuff, we let them go. And so God hardened Pharaoh's heart to the point where he said, Now, let's go get them and bring them back. And the scripture, read, if you read it now, the scripture said he got his, his best chariots and his best captains and the horses and all this stuff, he got them together to lead the charge, and then he got all the other chariots in the place that was available to get with him. So he's got this huge army of chariots and men now pursuing the Israelites. Now here they are sitting beside the Red Sea. And you know, in first thing it says, well, you know, you know, Moses is God must not be too much of a strategician because he's got them, you know, their backs against the water. You know, they, there's nowhere they can go. And, I, and so what's the first thing the Israelite people do? Here they come. Here they come. Are there no graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here, you know, us out here to die? You know, they come out here to kill us? And, uh, and the Lord told Moses, he said, you know, and he starts crying. He said, why are you crying out to me? He said, if you go over to the water, he said, you stretch your hands out and stretch your rod out. And he said, the sea will, you know, it'll separate. And it did. The sea separated, and they walked across on dry land. Amen. Amen. They walked across all the way on dry land. Now, when God removed the barrier that He had set up and, and let them through, by the time they got to the Red Sea, that dry land had now become mud, and then chariots start going through there. And the weight of that chariot, the people on them chariots, some things weren't going too quite fast. You know, you get a lot of mud on your tires and stuff. And you, going to go too quick Amen. and too fast. So they make it across. And they get across. He raises, Moses raises his hands again and looks at And the water comes together and wipes them out. And Amen. This, Amen. He says, he said, this, he said, this day, remember this day, after this day, these horses, these chariots, and these men, you will see no more. And he wiped out the entire the entire army of Pharaoh and all of his chariots just by letting the water go back against them. You cannot come against God and God's people and expect God just to sit back and not do anything about it. Amen. You can, you, you can, he will let you go, them go so far, but after a certain point in time, God's going to say enough is enough. Amen. We're going to put a stop to this. If you're walking with God, Believing in Him, trusting on Him, relying upon Him, and following after Him, and everything He tells you to do, when you get to a certain point, God's going to say, "Hey, don't do that anymore. Let's turn, let's turn around, and let's face the enemy, and and, and, and let, let's let's 
stand now. Number one, if that don't work, we may have to go to battle. But you know what I like? I love the song, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. So all you got to do is give it to Him. He's going to fight your battles for you. But you've got to come to a point where that you, you get fed up. You don't want to do this anymore. And you just, hey. Now all through this, all through this thing, and all through this stuff, the people of Israel were complaining to Moses. They were whining. They were crying. You know, they didn't have anything to eat. So then, you know, quail started falling from the sky. You know, just by the, you know, to feed all these thousands and thousands of people that were following him. So the quail comes down, and then, then they get complaining about having quail to eat. You know, don't have anything to eat. Now we got quail. You know, and I'm getting tired of quail. I guess it was a chicken in those days. <laughs> they complained about it. And everything that happened, they was complaining, complaining, whining, you know, going to Moses, you know. And uh, they were even plotting one time, you know, to kill Moses and kill Aaron. You know, and, and God went to Moses one time and he says, I'm tired of this. These whining, complaining, just groaning, groaning people. They just all the time doing something in. He said, let's just wipe them out and start over. He was to the point where that he was fed up. And so you, you look at and, and Moses interceded for them and told, you know, pleaded with God not to do that because he just brought them out of Egypt. He rescued them out of Egypt and brought them out. And he didn't want people thinking, you know, this great and wonderful God he did all this work to get these people out here. And then he turns around and he does away with them. And he, he pleaded with God. He interceded with him. And that's basically what he told God. He said, you know, what are people going to think? What's going to be your legacy? You know, what, what are people going to say about you if you do this? And so God said, okay, I'll let them live. But I fed up. So they go through all this stuff. And, and if you read it, you get into Exodus and you go on over. And now that they're, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They're on the banks of the water. And they're getting ready to send, you know, the people in to, uh, hey, yeah, go to Numbers. Yeah, go to Numbers. Chapter 12, verse 16. <laughs> If 
I mispronounce some of these, I apologize. And Talma, and probably three cities of the sons of Anak were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Eskel and cut down from there a branch of one cluster of grapes and they carried it in a pole between them and they brought some pomegranates and figs and the place was called the valley of Eskel, the cluster because of the cluster of the Israelites cut down. And they returned from scouting after 40 days. That is a key piece of information. They come back after 40 days. Okay? They came to Moses and Aaron in the Israelite congregation in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought them the word and showed them the fruits of the land. And they told Moses, We came into the land which you sent us, and surely it flows of milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But the people who dwell there are strong, and their cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, there are sons of Adak, in which you know, Adak and the descendants were giants. And Amalek dwells in the land of the south of the Hittite, the Jebusite, the Amorite dwell in the hill country. The Canaanite dwells by the sea and along the side of the Jordan River. Caleb quieted the crowd before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. We are well able to conquer it. But his fellow scouts said, We're not able to go up and do that. We can't do it. We can't go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought the Israelites an evil report of the land which they had scouted out, saying, The land through which we went to spy out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the Nephilim, the giants, the sons of Adak, who come from the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were, so grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And all the congregation cried out in a loud voice, and they wept that night. And the Israelites grumbled and deplored their situation, accusing Moses and Aaron, to whom the whole congregation said, Would, it, would that it, we died in Egypt, or that we had died in this wilderness? Why does the Lord bring us to this land? They were at a point in their life, in their journey, where they had to make a decision. Are we going to listen and go to where God has sent us and gave us this land? And the, and the key word there, God has gave them that land. All they had to do is to go into the land and possess it. How many times, you read through the Bible, how many times through numbers, uh, the odds were <coughs> Uh, strongly against the people of God and their armies when they went in somewhere to do battle. And through the, the, the workings and the miracles of God, they went in and overcame every obstacle and, and, and overthrew these armies, these great things, and through the power of God because they knew it, they could rely and depend on God because He said, just go do it. And He told the Israelites, just go possess the land. Oh, no, we can't do that, man. We we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't go over and do that. And again, you know, God's telling them, you know, go ahead and do it. So, what are you going to do? God had gave them a place to dwell. And what he calls it? The land of milk and honey. You know, and he, he was putting them in a place where they wouldn't have to, wouldn't have to really struggle with trying to make a living trying to get their farm crops and running. And you know, if you talk about carrying a cluster of grapes on a pole between two men, they're that big. That's a lot of grapes. You could buy one at Publix for four dollars. Instead of buying a bag. But it, it's they come back and, and they're they're complaining, they're crying, you know, we can't do this, you know, they're, they're just gonna and, and we'd be we just be squished. So, and also God would not let them go into it. So the 40 days that they were in scouting out the land, God put them in the wilderness one year for each day that they were in the land. So for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness until they were able to come back and that generation had passed before they could cross the river and go in. So God had God had finally let him go into the land, but it wasn't anything that they were. It wasn't an easy. It wasn't an easy journey for them to do. It wasn't an easy thing for them to do. But because they didn't listen to God, 
because they didn't do what God had told them. God had promised them that. Didn't it? It, it? Just a... Uh, you know, that goes back to, you know, you got to believe it. you got to rely on it. you got to trust it. You know, if, if God tells you to do something, to do it. Because He has good things in plan for you. Not bad things. He doesn't do anything to hurt you or harm you. But he does do good things for you and will bring you through. You know, and I, I love it. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, not camping out, but going through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Or you're with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. He does that every day. With every situation we get into, whatever we're walking through, God is with us. And he will guide us and take us out of that. If we believe in what he's saying, and his promises and what he's telling us he will do. Is heaven real? Yes. Is hell real? Yes. And we're going to spend eternity in one of those two places. Amen? Amen. And you're, going, you're going to have an eternal life. And it just depends upon you which one that you want to take and which journey you want to take and where you want to spend eternity. And this, people say, oh, God would put you in, in a place like that, in a lake of fire. According to the scriptures, that is what it is. It's a lake of fire. But the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. It's eternal suffering. God didn't put us there. We choose to go there. Amen. Amen. So it, it, he put a place there. And uh, as today said, hey, you have a choice. Where do you want to spend eternity? Where do you want your eternal life to be in? You want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell? You know, it, a lot of people will not accept what God has for them because they don't think that, you know, they need it. Come now, I used to work for one of the things that we had to do when we go into the place, we had to show the people at the place we was going into what we were, were giving them was advantageous to them because this is where you're at, and this is the reason you're where you're at, is because you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you're not doing this. But I have the answer. I have the remedy for it. If you do this, all this stuff will improve, and you'll go from here to here. The same thing with, with, with Jesus and believing in God. You know, where are you at? You're struggling. You don't know what's happening. You don't know why things are happening the way they are. You're down here, and you could be up here. You, you could be on the plane down here in sin. You could be on the plane down here struggling, but you could be up here above all the struggles and everything and letting the Lord lead you. Now, I won't think I'm telling you that you're not going to have difficulty, because you will. Because when you get, you think Satan's after you now, when you get saved, it's mercy. <laughs> He loves, he loves to come after you then. Especially, especially new, new converts, as they call them, or new believers. You know, it, it, you feel any different. You don't look any different. You look the same to me. And he'll tell you all this stuff, which you know that in your heart and in your spirit is not true. That you haven't been born again. You are, you are a new Christian. You are walking now where God wants you to walk. So you, you have a choice. You have a choice. You can go either one or two ways. And the description there says, you know, where your where your where your heart is is where your treasure will be. You know, and, and where is your heart? You know, if you, if your heart's in heaven, that's where your treasure's going to be. And it also says, lay up treasures in heaven. Don't lay up stuff here you on know, treasures here on earth, where laws and, and, and worms and all this other stuff just destroy it and rust and it, it goes away. But your heavenly treasures are always there. And you can still store up and build any decision to make with your life. You either live for God and go to heaven, or you don't live for God and you're going to hell. You, know, you, you can't sugarcoat this. I mean, you've you got to tell people the truth. You know, you, you're, either, you're either going to go one or two places. And you can't, you can't say, well, you know, I'll think about it, you know, maybe I'll do it next week, I'll do it next month. You know, it, the, the Bible says the time of salvation is now. Yes. And what are you talking about now, today? Mm -hmm. so if you don't know
know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I pray that you will come to know Him and the fullness of what He has for you. And every, every good thing that you can ever imagine. And this will come back. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you that uh, we are able to get together. Father, I praise you for the, the people that are here. Lord, we thank you for the visitors that came. Father, we thank you for Sean coming back. Lord, we thank you for his testimony this morning, Lord. Lord, we, we just thank you for everything that you're doing, Father, in our in our church family. And, and again, Father, the ones that are traveling, we ask you, Father, to protect them and bless them, Father, in their way. And Father, in the sicknesses, Lord, that you, you address and heal and complete the healing that you've started, Lord. Father, we love you this morning. We just praise your name, Lord. And everything that we do, Father, we, we want it to be, Father, for your glory and your honor. Lord, we praise you this morning and we thank you, Father. We love you. Oh, Lord Jesus. And we just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit rule and reign in our lives and lead and guide and direct us, Father. We praise you this morning, Father. We praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone can say, Amen. Amen. Uh, we don't have anything going on at church tonight. Uh, so we'll pick back up again Wednesday. That next Wednesday? Yeah. Hey, you're, you're getting service on Wednesday. Sure, you can say one more one. Yeah. I just feel like I've got to say it. Okay. <laughs> it's Sunday night. Starts at six. Be here at five thirty. Starts at six. Be here at five thirty. Starts at six. Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you.